This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. To welcome you to the DFJ Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Lecture Series. And uh, we always have a room full of students, but also guests. So one of the groups I want to acknowledge today is we have a group of faculty here from Chile. So if you're a faculty member from Chile, will you raise your hand so everyone can see you? OK, welcome. Uh, hola. OK, great. And uh, are, there, are there any other groups here that we should acknowledge? Anyone? Raise your hand if you're a visitor. OK, great. So welcome, and uh, we're delighted to have you here. This is open every week, and uh, we love to make this available to our students here. But it's also available online. If you can't be here in person, you can always go to the website ecorner.stanford.edu and watch the videos, video clips, uh, podcasts. You can get the eCorner uh, app for your iPhone. So you can download it and basically have these lectures anywhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, this is brought to you every week by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and also by BASIS, the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. Uh, you can watch it online, as I said, at eCorner, but also it's brought to us by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. It is my incredible honor to introduce our guest today. Jeff Yang is a founding partner at Redpoint Ventures, and his focus is on consumer media and infrastructure. The thing that must be relevant to you is that he was also an engineering student. He got an engineering degree from Princeton and then got his MBA at Stanford Business School. I'm sure he's got a lot to share with us. Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, uh, my contact information is here, as, as is my Twitter handle. And if you, follow, if, if you don't follow me, feel free if you'd like to. If you do, I apologize for uh, all the spam that came out today. Apparently, somebody hacked my, uh, my Twitter account and was throwing out uh, all this advice on how to lose 20 pounds in two weeks. And I, I actually didn't realize how many friends I had because I had a whole mailbox full of direct messages earlier on Twitter. And uh, you know, people said, uh, people were asking all about uh, you know, all these nutrients and things. And, and the next thing you know, it's, it's it, I, I guess it's nice to hear from your friends, but I wish it hadn't been about losing 20 pounds in two weeks. Uh, but if you're interested, I'll pass those on to you. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about for the next uh, 40 minutes or so is a little bit about, about timing generally. right? And I think it, it's a very popular topic right now about uh, uh, all the opportunities that are out in the market. And, and as you know, uh, entrepreneurial activity is about as fervent as it's ever been. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, wow, maybe someday or maybe now I'm going to start a company. And what I want to talk to you a little bit about is, is you know, if, you, if you're ever thinking about it you know, sometime now or in the future, I want to talk to you a little bit about the founders and kind of what makes, in my opinion, some of the attributes of successful founders. I'll talk about markets. Uh, because you know, there's always this, this age-old debate. What's more important, you know, the, 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 uh, the management or the market? Right? It's a little bit like the chicken or the egg. And, and it's at the end of the day, every argument in history will come down to what's more important? Is it the people or is it the market? And, and you can make your own decision. I happen to be at the margin kind of a markets person, but I'll, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that and, and attributes of an attractive market. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about growing a company and financing a company in case you're thinking of starting something and want to get it financed. And it, this is, a lot of this is generic. I mean, obviously, I'm a venture capitalist, so I'm going to give you my perspective. But I'm trying to keep it somewhat balanced uh, because venture capital isn't for everybody. And we'll talk about that for a minute. And then, uh, and then I'll give you just some, a little bit of uh, insight on how we evaluate opportunities. And, and even if you don't go, end up going to a venture capitalist, I always think, it's great to have the lens uh, of, of you know, as a prospective investor because as an entrepreneur, you know, many of you will be investing your time, which is arguably an even more valuable resource than, than money. So with that, uh, I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just start with just, you know, founders are just extraordinary and entrepreneurs are, are extraordinary. And there aren't really any ordinary ones. I mean, I've got some pictures of some of the people we've backed recently, you know, Dave Morin, uh, who's the CEO of Path. Before he started Path, uh, he was a kind of co-creator of Facebook Connect and the Facebook platform. Before that, he had been at Apple, uh, where he had gone right out of school uh, you know, from Boulder. Then you, uh, uh, then you, have, um, um, you have Kevin here from Stripe, 
Uh, he was, uh, at age 16, uh, won the European Science uh, Award and then ended up going to MIT, uh, started a company that was trying to build tools uh, for, uh, uh, for making uh, eBay a more efficient uh, environment. Ended up selling that uh, pretty much within a year after starting it. You know, they always talk about how he became kind of a millionaire uh, kind of overnight at age 18 or 19. And then ended up, uh, uh, when he sold the company, stayed there for a couple years and uh, uh, dropped out of MIT and then ended up starting Stripe in 2010, which is a way to uh, uh, payment enable kind of any website. And they're, they're going through pretty, some pretty substantial growth. You have Katarina Fake. Uh, next to uh, ne next to him, and uh, uh, she uh, uh, finished Vassar and went to uh, join the Well, which is one of the first online communities uh, in 1985. Uh, went and uh, started Flickr. Uh, Flickr was then sold to Yahoo. Uh, and then she started Hunch. Uh, Hunch was then sold, and and recently we backed her, uh, starting something called Findery. Uh, which is trying to bring uh, life to locations. You know, uh, if if walls could talk, so you could leave notes kind of all over the place. And and next to her is a fellow named uh, Christian Yorge, uh, who is uh, running a company called Tidemark right now. Christian has a really compelling personal story. Uh, he's a refugee from Romania. Uh, when he left, uh, there were armed uh, guards shooting at him as he was swimming across the river. Uh, ended up getting to New York. Uh, drove a cab. Uh, ended up uh, owning a, a, a limo service. Uh, he was a computer scientist in Romania. Uh, so then he ended up starting a company called Outlooksoft, which did uh, business analytics, was sold to Hyperion for about $400 million. And now he's doing the same thing for business analytics you know, in the cloud. So I mean, all these people have very uh, kind of compelling uh, stories as entrepreneurs. And, and at the end of the day, n no entrepreneurs or no founders are kind of ordinary. You know, they all have you know, very interesting kind of compelling stories. So you know, as, 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 I, as I talk a little bit about uh, 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 founders, and you know, there, there are a bunch of kind of myths that I just wanted to talk a little bit about. You know, the first is founders first, ideas second. And, and the notion is, you know, I'm going to decide to start a company. And once I just to start a company, I'll find an idea. Uh, uh, and an idea will just come to me, and that's how I'm going to start the company. And, and you know, my point of view is that you know, entrepreneurs really aren't created. They're compelled. And the best entrepreneurs are the ones that have, they come up with this idea, and they think, this idea is going to change the world. And I, if I don't do it, I don't know who else is going to do it. And, and I think the world would be a better place by starting it. So, uh, I don't believe that it's founder first, idea second. I really think it's idea first, and, and the idea compels the founder. Uh, and, and that you have to have a passion for it. You can't just decide, well, I'm going to start a company because it's in my, uh, I'm, I'm planning my career, and now is the right time for me to start a company, or I see a lot of other people starting companies, so I should go start a company. You have to be passionate about it, and it's got to drive you and like, compel you to start a company. Uh, the second uh, common myth is, well, it's either now or never. Uh, uh, now's the time, and everybody else is doing it. I should do it. And, and you know, whether or not I'm ready, you're never really ready, I should go do it. You know, I, I really believe that, that uh, the best entrepreneurs, and, and, and I'll tell you some more stories about some of the entrepreneurs as we go along, or are happy to do so, they build a foundation, right? And uh, they, they learn and make mistakes on someone else's nickel. Uh, they figure out, you know, for instance, uh, you learn how to manage you know, engineering products. You learn how to uh, spec projects. Uh, you learn how to manage people. You learn how to do cost-benefit analyses. You learn how to scope markets and what's a big market, what's a little market. You learn to hire and fire people, right? And, and the ability to do that on someone else's nickel and somewhat, in some ways, you know, make mistake on someone else's nickel uh, is really an incredible luxury. And it's also an opportunity to expand your network. You know, the best way to, to start a company, I think, is to, to, to bring people that you know are, are really um, incredible people that you can rely on and you can trust. And you, you may not want to take a lot of risk you know, on those people. So to the extent that you know them and you've worked with them or you know other people who know them is, is really important. So you know, it isn't always now or never. Uh, the third, you know, common myth is that homework is for losers. You know, I, I uh, the point of view would be, well, 
you know, you never know everything. I'm just going to go with my gut, and I kind of feel as if uh, I'm ready, and I'm just going to go do this, even though I haven't really done any homework. And, and, and I, I really disagree with that. Uh, you know, certainly, you can't know everything, you know, when you're starting a, a, a new company, especially one where you're, um, you're doing something that no one ever has been able to do before. You know, people will say, well, how do I do market analysis on a market that doesn't really exist? Well, you know, in my opinion, w when you're going and starting and you're putting your energy in, in uh, starting a company, you're really making a pretty significant investment, just as if, you know, uh, when, I, when we invest in a company, we're making a very significant investment. And you owe it to yourself to do your homework. You owe it to yourself to go find out what is the competition doing, uh, uh, how big is this market, uh, what are the reasons why it might fail or why it might, uh, might succeed, and, and really kind of put together the whole, um, the whole landscape of what you're counting on for this to be a successful venture. And if you don't do that, you're kind of cutting yourself short. And, and I mention this because it's kind of amazing to me when I meet entrepreneurs and they really haven't done any homework on how big the market size is, or you ask them about, well, what is this person, you know, what is this company doing, or what is that person doing, or have you heard of this, or you heard of that? And they say, no, I haven't really done any of that work. You know, it, it, it really uh, is not the right way to go about doing this because you are making an investment and you're making an investment in, in the most valuable thing you have, which is your time, your energy, and your reputation, and you owe it to yourself to do some homework. That isn't to say that you need to know everything and all your information needs to be perfect. You just need to kind of know what you're betting on in order to do that. And the last one is, boy, you know, nothing like this has been tried before. And you know, my opinion is that almost every business model has been tried. It may not have been tried in exactly that, uh, that business and that incarnation, but every, you, if you can squint and you can think about, well, what happened, you know, so for instance, on Monday at our partners meeting, we were talking about subscription commerce, right? And one of the big things, one of the big things, uh, popular things today is, is, you know, these are subscription commerce sites where you uh, sign up for a monthly subscription to some either product or service or, or what have you, and it just comes. And people will say, well, is this model working? They'll go, well, you never know. Uh, it hasn't really been tried before. Well, you know, you go all the way back to uh, uh, the early 70s, and there was this thing called Columbia House you know, Records and Tape where every, every, every month they'd send you three uh, new albums. And unless you canceled, you know, it would, uh, the, the album would come. Or you think about, uh, just on an analogy, uh, AOL. You know, it's, it's a monthly subscription service that if you didn't cancel, you know, it would, your credit card would just be renewed. And, and the fact that, you know, my belief is that almost every model has been tried. It may not have been, been exactly tried in that industry. It may be, you know, in different industries within different periods of time. But they're very instructive as to, you know, how corporations view it or how consumers view it and, and how behavior kind of works. And, and uh, you know, I always encourage entrepreneurs and I always ask them, well, what's the analogy for this business? You know, what is it most like? Uh, is it like, you know, uh, it, it's, is it like how Cisco did it or, or is it like how Federal Express did it or is it like, um, uh, you know, if it's a, even, even restaurant analogies, whatever. I, I always look for analogies and I think, I, I think it's, it's really a myth that nothing like this has ever been tried before. So if you, if you take a step from there, and, and I just want to share with you some attributes of what I think great entrepreneurs do. Uh, in my experience, you know, and I talked about this a minute ago, entrepreneurs have a driving passion to change the world. And you know, what I don't, um, uh, lots of times, uh, when, when I will go and uh, think about investing in a company, one of the things I really like to do is understand why an entrepreneur uh, wants to start the company, what's driving them to succeed. And almost, I can almost never get that in a meeting. It takes a few meetings to do that, and I usually go to dinner, to go to dinner with the entrepreneur, and you know, if I could, I would figure a way to meet their family, I'd figure a way to play a sport with them, I'd figure a way to do you know, just whatever, just to kind of understand what their psyche is. Uh, but I almost always end up talking to them about, well, well why do you want to, you know, why do you want to do this? And, and really what I'm looking for is what's driving them. Um, and if they say, I want to make a lot of money, th that's not, I don't think that's enough to be a driving passion to want to change the world. You know, it, if it works out uh, and you're lucky enough that a, that a company is really successful, 
you know, that's, that's terrific and it's going to be financially really lucrative. But that's more the, um, the effect and it's really not the cause, right? The cause is that they have a vision, uh, uh, they want to change the world and they want to make the world, you know, a better place. And, and I always spend time trying to understand what is the person's passion and what, what's going to cause them to you know, walk, you know, run through uh, concrete walls in order to make it happen. Because you know, as you'll see in a minute, I'm going to talk about willing a company to success. You know, they're going to go and they're going to convince other people to leave their jobs and, and take, to take salary cuts and really bet their careers. And before you know it, you're going to have hundreds of people around the company that are betting on this person and the passion uh, of, of what the uh, original vision was. And it can't be just to make money. That, 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 that is a, that's a horrible culture that will never survive. It's got to be about, you know, I'm going to change the world. And I have this vision about how to make this a better world. The second uh, big, uh, the, the, the second attribute of winning entrepreneurs, I think, is, is the ability to see chaos, uh, see patterns where other people see chaos. I, I talk a lot about this, about pattern recognition. I get people coming in and they'll say, oh, I see this trunk. And it's, it's really interesting. It's going to be the best trunk in the world. And someone else comes in and says, well, it's going to be a, a foot. And I know how we're going to make the best foot there is in the world. Someone else comes in and says, well, I got a, I got a, um, uh, I got a tail. And it's going to be the best tail I've ever seen. And someone else says, you know, I've got a tusk. And before you know it, you, know, you start seeing that everybody's kind of describing an elephant, right? And, and part of our job as venture capitalists is to try to put all those pieces together and try to recognize patterns. The best entrepreneurs that I see come in and say, well, I see this happening over here, I see this happening over here, I see this happening over here. The logical thing is that now all the pieces are coming together that, that the world is going to look like this. And, and it, you know, they see it as clear as day and, and they feel compelled to go uh, uh, get in front of that market because they see if, if, if they don't do it, uh, they're not sure someone else will, or they can't stand the thought that someone else is going to get there in front of them. The third is, uh, you know, you have to have this passion, you have to have the, the conviction, but you have to be able, able to articulate it. Because when you're starting a company, all you have is the power of the idea, right? And if you can't convince other people that it's the right idea, so imagine that, that you're one person with this fantastic idea, uh, and you're going to start a, a, a social network, and, and it's just going to be every, you know, the 900 million people are going, to, are going to connect. But if you can't convince anybody else to come help you, how are you ever going to do it, right? And so you've got to be able to have a vision and be able to articulate it to other people so that you can convince them to do it, and that they can convince other people to do it, and people will put money into it, and, and service providers will provide services to it. So being able to articulate it is really an important po point. Uh, the fourth is willing a company into existence. Um, you know, in the beginning, there really, as I said, there really isn't anything other than an idea. And the very, the first five hires and the first three or four months, you know, all you have is your belief in what you're doing is right. And you have to have the, the conviction, but you also have to be able to have the fortitude to be able to will, but by force of will, the company, you know, uh, exists. And if you have any doubt, uh, everybody else will see it in you, and, and the company will, will, never, you know, uh, uh, will never end up forming. And so you know, my advice to you is to do all your homework up front, but once you commit to do it, if you commit to do it, you're going to do it, and there is no path back. That doesn't mean to say that you're going to be stupid and you're going to be foolish, but you've got to will companies to, into existence. The fifth is you know, I think entrepreneurs are, are genetically paranoid. Anybody who's not paranoid is going to end up getting, getting eaten. Hopefully not literally. Um, the sixth is uh, being able to recognize and support your own weaknesses. Nobody's perfect, and the best entrepreneurs I see, you know, understand what their areas of weaknesses are, and they go hire other people, or team up with other people, or they they bring in as advisors or board members people that can help them be better, and they recognize their own weaknesses. The seventh is soliciting advice, but you make your own decision. So I hear this all the time. Uh, about, well, you know, as a board member, they'll say, well, what do you want to do? And I, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to give you advice, uh, but you're going to be the one who's going to make the decision. And the, the, the best entrepreneurs 
I know, they, they solicit advice and they listen and they process, but they quickly make a decision. You don't want an entrepreneur that won't solicit, solicit advice because, you know, that's a, th then they say, well, you know, I know all the answers, I'm not going to ask for any help. But you also don't want one that says, okay, everybody, give me whatever you think and collectively we're going to make this, this group decision that, that uh, and I'm not going to make any decision. I, I want somebody who's going to listen, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, make their own decision and, and be, be responsible for that decision. And then lastly, be able to make decisions on incomplete information and fix the bad ones along the way. I, I end up giving this advice probably um, not to 90% of the first time entrepreneurs, which is, hey, you can't get all the information. By the time you get all the information, it's too late. And by not making a decision, you've made a decision. All I ask is you quickly make decisions, and if they're wrong, Fix the bad ones quickly, you know. Make just, but what you have to do is you have to rapid fire decision making because in an early stage company, you don't have the luxury of time. And if you did, you'd end up looking like uh, a very large company that, that has meetings about meetings and it takes, you know, two or three years to make a decision. What young companies have is the ability to kind of rally the troops, do something, do it overnight, make the decision, commit, and move on. And if it's the wrong decision, if you hire the wrong person, fire that person. That's okay, as long as you do it quickly. Just don't, don't linger on bad decisions. Uh, and then finally, sweat the details. I, I don't know any really good entrepreneur that doesn't sweat the details. And this, this you know, um, almost every great manager, CEO I know also, you know, knows, knows the important facts and can tell you, uh, they've got the clarity of saying what are the, what, what, what are the, five or ten really important variables that drive my business and, and once I know them, I, I know the details of those numbers, right? And I always am very wary of a, a CEO who comes in who really doesn't know, you know any of the details of some of the most uh, important, uh, important um, uh, variables and their important uh, KPIs. And, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So that's what I think make great entrepreneurs. The other aspect is, you know, once you start a company, you got to you got to have some leadership, right? And and not all entrepreneurs are great leaders, uh, but some are. And the ones that are really good, I think, are the ones that can clearly articulate a strategy and a purpose. Um, you know, as a company gets bigger, uh, 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 an entrepreneur can have less and less uh, direct control over the knobs. They have to be able to work through other people. And as you uh, start developing a larger organization, you may have either business units or you might have uh, functional units. And you're going to be less, you're going to have your hands less and less on the operations. So what you have to do is you have to create a culture where everybody understands what the big purposes of, of, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the main missions and the strategy of the company and why what they're doing is important to achieving that success. So you have to be able to clearly articulate a strategy and a, pur a purpose. I think, they, I think great uh, uh, leaders lead by example. You know, you can't say, okay, everybody, we're going to go really work really hard and I'm going to go take a, a three-hour lunch and, and uh, go take a swim by the pool. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You know, leadership happens by example. Um, the third is that they recognize that they win because the team wins. Uh, lots of times you'll see, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and, and leaders have, many of them have very big egos. And the ones that succeed best are the ones that recognize that for me to succeed, every, the team has to succeed. And you have to be able to, to share responsibility and share successes because if you can't share responsibility and share successes, you can't share failures and you can't pin uh, 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 bad outcomes on people, right? You have to be able to, to understand that uh, uh, you got to win and you win as a team and you have to, you have to be productive as a team. Uh, the fourth is that they never give up. Uh, you, you know, you see this all the time in, in entrepreneurs' offices. You'll see the signs that say never, never, ever, 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 ever give up, right? And that's, you know, one of the things that I admire most about entrepreneurs is that they'll They'll come up to a, a stone wall, and they'll sit there, and they'll try to bang through the wall. They'll try to bang through the wall. And uh, you know, some people would walk away, and they'll go think about it overnight. And next thing you know, they walk around the wall, right? Um, the, you know, the, the, you, you kind of, uh, there's so many reasons why a startup company should fail. 
you know, versus a company that has a lot, lot of resources, a lot of market share, a lot of customers. And the reason they succeed is because somebody has, uh, somebody has uh, uh, the nugget of an idea and a passion to make it work. They have the people who are dedicated and they adjust along the way, right? I've never, in my 27 years in the venture business, I've never seen a business plan that, was, uh, that we initially funded on, on the first round actually get executed exactly the way that it was supposed to be, right? Almost everybody changes path along the way and they do mid-course corrections and it's, it's really important. And then the last is hiring up. Um, uh, almost great, every great leader you'll see will, will always try to raise the average with the next hire. And, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So I just thought I'd just share with you uh, a couple of you know, uh, great entrepreneurs. You know, the first is John McFarland at, so uh, at Sonos. And John was, uh, was at Sun. Uh, he ended up starting this company called Software.com. He sold it to Phone.com. Uh, and then he started this company called Sonos, which many of you may know is uh, uh, their, th they view their mission statement as filling every room in the house uh, with music. And, and they want to be able to play every song in the world and stream it to every room in the world and have people uh, rediscover the joy of music. Right? And they do this with you know, a set of wire wireless speakers and, and bridges and they connect to music services. But what John does really, really well is he's, he's incredibly committed to the vision and he, he, would, he was willing to do kind of whatever it takes to fulfill a customer value proposition, which is he wants to fill every house in, in the world with beautiful music and he wants everybody to enjoy it. And he's able to hire you know, some of the best people around the world that, that just, you know, and a lot of uh, uh, acoustic engineers and design engineers are kind of different kind of people. But when you give them a chance to say, I, I want to give people the enjoyment and rediscover music, it's, it's, it's really remarkable. He's hired a group of people that all have worked with him before, and he's able to articulate a, a grand vision. And despite having been extremely successful, it all happens because John is, is at the helm, and you know, he makes it work, and he, and he leads by example. Uh, and I just, I think the world of him, uh, but I also love his vision and I'm completely bought into it. Another, another guy, Reed Hastings, that we backed in Netflix, um, uh, you originally came to us, I mean, his background was, um, uh, he was actually in the Peace Corps and then he was in a, in a startup company that was a spin out of NET called Adaptive. And then he started a company called Pure uh, Software, which was ultimately uh, sold for quite a bit of money. And then he came to us with this idea that, that he, was going to, um, uh, he was going to have mail order service for DVD uh, rentals. And we said, God, isn't that crazy? Why wouldn't people just go to Blockbuster and rent a, rent a DVD? And he said, well, because you know, this is much easier and, and uh, consumers are really getting ripped off now by all the late fees. And we really think we can, you know, consumers would really like to have a few DVDs around the house all the time. And we think we can have a, um, uh, a logistic system that can get, that, get them there. And we think it'll be a significantly better experience and we think it's better for the consumer. Uh, and if it's at the expense of Blockbuster, it's, it's gonna be at the expense of, expense of Blockbuster. And you know, a lot of us thought it was kind of crazy, uh, but every time we, we pushed on him on, well, what about this? Why won't, this won't work because of this model. He had thought about it and he showed us the, the nine reasons why it would work and he tells us all the people he talked to. And then we'd say, well, well, you know, uh, uh, this won't work here because, uh, you know, the Postal Service is going to take too long. He goes, no, I thought about this, and, and, and here, are the, here are the things to do about this. Well, and then the studios aren't going to give you, you know, the DVDs and the appropriate windows. Or you, well, yeah, we've talked to them and here all. And this was, guy was so compelling that despite the fact that we thought it was kind of crazy, we just felt that this was kind of a guy that, that, that we, sh we had to invest in. And, and Netflix has turned out to be a pretty good company. And even today, you know, Reed is probably recognized as one of the more um, uh, entrepreneur models of entrepreneurial leadership. And, and if you, he has, he talks about something called freedom and responsibilities that you, you might want to just look up. You know, there's a slide deck you can look up on the internet that's pretty widely distributed. And what he talks about is in a large organization, he wants to give everybody the freedom 
to do what they think is the right thing to do for the company, and he wants to give them the responsibility so that they feel as if you know, they, they have to own up to it both for both the good results and the bad results. And Netflix is a remarkably, uh, a, a remarkably effective uh, company where you know, everybody kind of knows what they're trying to, where they're trying to go. They all know what, they're try, what, what, what their role is in trying to make that happen. And you know, he's, uh, he's a remarkable leader. And there, there's a, a story that I just heard recently, which I thought was interesting, which, where you know, he talks about this freedoms and responsibilities um, thing. And, and, and one of his employees said, you know, hey, I, I think everything you're talking about in this freedom responsibilities thing is BS. And he goes, why? He goes, well, you know, if you really believe that we should have the freedom and you're going to give us the responsibility, why do we have vacation days? Why do you care? Why are you trying to legislate you know, what, 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 how much time I take off as long, long as I get my work done? And Reed went back and he thought about it and he said, you're right. So now they no longer have vacation days. You basically take, take whatever time you need to take off as long as you get your work done. And, and it turns out that people take less vacation than they would otherwise be entitled. But, but you know, th these are examples of people who started the companies from the get-go but have emerged into terrific entrepreneurial leaders. So the next section I want to talk a little bit about is about markets and how you should think about markets. You know, the, the interesting thing is when I got in the venture business, market sizes were um, measured in tens of millions or low hundreds of millions of dollars, and they're mainly U.S. and mainly data processing oriented back offices. Today, they're world, worldwide and they're measured of tens of billions or, or hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's really kind of a remarkable, you know, transition. You know, for instance. There are 5.8 billion uh, mobile devices out in the world. That's more than people th th who have electricity or clean water. So you know, it's kind of, you live in a really great time. Um, and, and so one of the things is trying to find the right market at the right time. And I thought I'd just tell you, you know, a few stories of companies that I'm involved with. So, you know, so I got involved with uh, TiVo in the very beginning. And it was, it was a couple of, couple of guys who wanted to build kind of a, uh, a, a video server in the home. And the more we talked about it, uh, I was just coming off uh, the board of a company called Excite, which was uh, one of the early internet search engines. And one of the things that we learned from the internet was that uh, targeting and personalization, the ability to target and personalize content was really a powerful notion. And so I spent a lot of time talking to them and said, well, why can't we do this for television? Why can't we deliver a personalized television experience so that people don't have to just watch what's broadcast, but they can watch what they want to watch, when they want to watch it? And then they came up with, you know, how are we going to do it? And, and lo and behold, you know, we had to start with a set-top box, but more importantly, we started with a user experience. And TiVo was kind of born. And it, it was born at a time when I think the internet started training people that, hey, personalization is, is, is really important, and the television was kind of ripe for, for innovation. Um, I've got another company I'm involved with uh, called Machinima, and Machinima is, is a broadband content network that sits on top of YouTube, and it's targeted mainly to gamers. So in July, I'm sorry, in August, we, we served uh, 2.3 billion videos to about almost 200 million people, and it's, it's kind of grown like a weed, and it's mainly gaming content. And when I first met him, uh, it was very, it was really very small. But it was right around the time when um, um, uh, Call of Duty: Modern Warfare passed a billion dollars. It was the first video game to pass a billion dollar uh, uh, revenue. And then Avatar, kind of in the same month, passed a billion dollars. And I looked at the two uh, art forms and I thought, hey, those are pretty close. I mean, could it be that the, a lot of this stuff? And, and as you, many of you know, who are gamers, uh, the uh, the graphics are, are photorealistic, and, and you, it's kind of hard to tell certain movies from, uh, from certain games. And in fact, you go to movies today and you see trailers you know, for games, and I can't really tell in the beginning if they're, if they're promoting a movie or they're promoting a game. But you know, they, they started at a time, uh, uh, and we invested just you know, on a lark that said, hey, maybe this might become important. And next thing you know, YouTube is pouring hundreds of million dollars to create you know, the largest broadband MSO uh, MSO in the world, and you know our vision is you know machinima uh, machinima is to gamers what ESPN is to sports, right? ESPN isn't necessarily just about sports; it's about males, you know, uh, uh, 16 to 34, and that's kind of what machinima is all about. Uh, Bluefin is a spin out of MIT Media Labs, and uh, some of the statistics on people who watch television is about 70% of all 
tablet users have their tablet and about 68% of people who have a smartphone have their second screen sitting in front of them. And people are, are, are tweeting away or they're surfing or whatever. So Bluefin's idea was, hey, could we take all this, the, all these uh, information about what people are posting on Twitter and on Facebook and they're, they're writing on blogs and could we somehow correlate that to a full TV feed and if we could, if we could parse the, uh, the TV stream into discrete events and we could somehow associate social response to what was happening you know, on television, wouldn't that be kind of cool in, in building the lar world's largest real-time uh, focus group on the fly? Right now, what happens is uh, you know, a TV show will come on and they'll do a, a focus group testing and about three weeks later they'll, they'll, they'll do unaided uh, response rates and, and they'll, three weeks later they'll be able to tell you do people like it, whether they like it, whether they not like it. Well, with Bluefin, and it's really a large data analytics and, and crunching problem, they're able to tell you almost real time how people are reacting so that you could change your message. And, and there are examples of during the Olympics of how people have changed, changed their creative on, on uh, network spots uh, based on what reactions are, uh, of people are. And you know, we think that's kind of an interesting trend. And it, wouldn't, it really wouldn't be possible without advances in, in compute technology, without algorithmic advances, without uh, all everybody posting, but it kind of all came together at, at the right time, and we think it's a pretty interesting idea. And the last one is Electric Imp, which is founded by uh, one of the uh, Apple iPhone engineers and, and some of the Google uh, software engineers. And the notion is they want to create an Internet of Things, right? And and their whole pitch is now it's gotten to the point where people really are uh, wearable technology, home technologies. I'm sure you've all heard of Nest, which is you know, the thermostat you can control over the internet. Well, what if you control everything in your home uh, uh, over the internet? Wouldn't that be kind of cool? What, what if it were lights and, and uh, door locks and uh, temperature stuff and water and sprinklers? And what if you could put it on your dog to know where your dog was? And, and what if you could do it on uh, your elderly grandmother just to make sure she's, she's safe or, or what have you? Wouldn't that be kind of a cool thing? And what they've developed as a platform and a reference design to allow anybody to kind of uh, hook something onto the internet for a very inexpensive price and then a back-end cloud service for connecting these things and monitoring these things either on a white label basis or, or directly. And, and that, that isn't possible except for the fact that you know, Wi-Fi is pretty much uh, everywhere, uh, compute is, is really inexpensive. And you know the ability to get miniaturization. I can get you know basically these computers on the size of SD uh, cards, and I can get them really inexpensively. That's kind of a cool thing. And so, you know, the point of this is that you know, lots of times you look for you look for dis discrete patterns that happen all come together at the same time, where you're able to say, you know, what I'm talking about would not have been possible or would not have been interesting until this point in time. And I think the ability to kind of look at a really high level and decide, wow, that must mean that there's an opportunity here is, is an important aspect to trying to find the right market. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is, well, what defines an attractive uh, market? Well, I think the, the most attractive one is the ability to do something that can't otherwise be done, right? So without what I do, uh, then uh, there would be you know, no market. And the ability to kind of create a market is really interesting. And, and if you have any doubt and you look at the market cap of companies within any particular sector, you'll find that about 50% of the market cap typically accrues to the market share leader. Right? So it's very profitable to be the not, uh, not only the first in the market, but if you're the first and you're the market share leader. So the ability to kind of help create a market uh, is quite interesting. The second is you know, uh, uh, something that fundamentally changes the economics of a solution. So by doing it, you can reduce the cost by, uh, by, by, by 10x, or, 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 or you, you, will, you allow what, what typically wouldn't be able to have be done, you, you can now be done. Uh, the third is that it's in the path of, path of progress. You don't need to know the market. If the market exists today and, uh, and it's being adequately served, you either have to come in with something, you know, I always talk about uh, general rule of thumb of, a, of attacking existing markets. It's got to be about 10x the performance, and it could be a maximum of, of three times the price. But, but arguably, in today's world, it, it's got to it, you know, be something along that, that lines of a, of, a, 
a 30x kind of improvement for people to switch. Because otherwise, you know, corporations or people would rather just stick with, you know, what, what, they already, what they're already using. Um, so being able to look at, um, well, if this happens here and this happens here, I really think that this really is in the path of progress and this is going to happen. So, you know, this notion of something that is in the path of progress and if it already exists, it's on the cover of Time Magazine, chances are it's too late. But if it's something that is, is controversial, but you can argue is in the path of progress, that's probably a pretty good, a pretty good uh, thing to, to take advantage of or take a look at, I should say. And then the last is what for me defines an attractive market. I, I, I want to be able to see how a company can get north of $100 million of revenues, you know, if, if it works. And ideally, multi hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. Now, that's from my perspective as a venture capitalist. That isn't true for, for, for you know, an individual investor or an angel investor. But, you know, for, for what I do, that's what I want. So let, let's talk now a little bit about investment and taking the money. And, and I, I referred to this earlier about whether or not to, to VC or not to VC, right? And, and the first is to say venture capital isn't for everybody, right? There are positives. The positives are you get professional help. That's all, what all we do. That's what we get paid to do and hope, are hopefully and arguably we're okay at it. Uh, and we have, you know, the, we provide the help and the expertise. We have a very large network of contacts, both to hire, to for partners, for, for um, uh, potential um, uh, distribution arrangements, you know, for all sorts of things. Uh, we come in with an unbiased set of eyes and, and brains. You know, when you sign us up, th there's, there's, no, there's no second agenda. It's not like you take money from a, a corporation and a corporation has a second agenda about, you know, the investment's only one thing. You know, our, our, our motivations are really clear. We're trying to make a great return for our limited partners. And we think the best way to do that is by building a very large, long-lasting, market share leading company, right? Uh, we, you know, we're extremely transparent. Uh, and the final thing is credibility. Lots of times, you know, when a company gets venture financed, I'll do this all the time where um, uh, I'll call up a potential recruit and I'll talk to them about all the other great companies that we finance and why we think this is the next one. And we're willing to put our reputation and our dollars behind it. And that level of credibility often, you know, right or wrong, you know, uh, is what's necessary to convince a candidate to kind of leave a, an otherwise interesting job. The negatives are dilution. You know, we are very ownership, uh, are very ownership uh, oriented. You know, uh, our typical ownership in a first round uh, investment is just, just a little under 25%, right? We're very ownership hungry. It's by no means the cheapest money that you'll find. And you won't, you'll give up a little bit of control. Uh, you know, what we don't want to do is, you know, we don't want to invest in something that's a hobby or something that somebody, that nobody ever wants to get liquidity in. And so by signing on to, you know, for venture capital, you're kind of, you're kind of buying into that, that, that roadmap. Uh, we have certain outcome expectations, you know, like, as I said, you know, something that is a, a at least f at our scale, something that could be a 10 or 15 or $20 million, you know, acquisition price may be very, you know, maybe terrific as an angel investment. It just doesn't work for, you know, an institutional venture capital firm like ours because we're looking to build, you know, very significant uh, uh, posi holding positions. And, and, and once you go back, uh, once you start, there's really no going back. You know, once we come on, you know, and I'll talk about this in, in uh, right here on the bottom point, it really becomes a marriage, right? You know, we're signing on, we're signing on with you, you're signing on with us, and we're going to be in this journey for a long period of time. And, and so when I talk to uh, potential companies that, that we invest in and I talk to them about going on the board, I really encourage them to do reference checks, and I really encourage them to take their time because as much as we're signing on with them, they're signing on with us, and it's going to be probably a five, six-year journey we're going to have together. It'll be a lot of fun, and we'll go through a lot of ups and downs, and it'll be thrilling, and it's exciting, but it's really hard for us to get divorced uh, at the end of the day. So in terms of raising money, you know, I would say just raise kind of generally what you need to get to the next milestone. Proof pays. In other words, once you get to that next milestone, it, it justifies a, an increase in valuation. And, and that'll minimize your dilution. And, and it's, you know, proof is, is really important. And, and I see this all the time because entrepreneurs will come in and they'll say, well, I want to raise $15 million. And I say, well, you don't really have that much. What does it take for you to get some initial market feedback? Well, 
that'll take a million and a half or two million dollars. Well, why not? Why don't we do that? You'll suffer less dilution, and and it's probably a better way to finance the company because I can't write that big a check and take that much risk. But on a smaller check, you know, I'd be willing to do that. And that kind of leads to the second thing about stay lean and mean. Um, I don't know why it is, but companies do better uh, when they don't have that many resources, right? Um, you know, they always talk about necessity is the mother of invention. Well, it's, it's definitely true. And when companies are really lean, they end up being more efficient and they figure out ways to do it. Um, uh, when you're, there's, a, there's a big uh, a slug of cash in the bank, people get a little bit lazier. And if you have a couple people that aren't really contributing, well, we can afford them. We'll just leave them on the payroll. That's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is if someone isn't working out, you should get rid of that person. You should be as lean as possible because smaller teams generally are more efficient you know, than larger teams. And having, to, having necessity as the mother uh, of invention is an incredibly powerful force. Companies I have seen that raise too much money end up being a little bit sloppy. They end up being a little bit slower. They end up delaying profitability. And, and I know it, it doesn't necessarily make logical sense because people say, well, I'll just raise the money and I'll leave it here and I won't touch it and we'll still be really lean and mean. My experience is it just doesn't happen that way. It's just not human nature. Um, I would hire after growth. You, you know, it used to be like in, in the bubble, people would say, well, you got to hire in anticipation of growth. That didn't work so well. Um, you know, my experience is that if, if you grow and you're always just a little bit lean in terms of not having enough people to kind of take advantage of the opportunity, that's, that's a pretty healthy place to be. It's a little bit like having a lab. You want it to be just a little bit on the lean side. Um, the fourth is uh, uh, maximize the pie, not just your slice. You know, at the end of the day, if you start a company, any of you can own 100% of it, but it probably won't be that big. I mean, what you want to do is you want to you want to try to figure a way to make the pie as big as possible so that the slices are really valuable. And then and then we talked about choosing your investor as a, a true business partner. So I'll talk a little bit for a minute about common misconceptions. Um, the first is that the customers are always right. That's kind of true, but not always. You know, my experience is that customers don't have any vision. They only have about a six to 12, 12 month you know, horizon. And lots of times when you're talking to them about something that's never been done, they can't really conceptualize what it is until they see it. There are very few people. One of the reasons entrepreneurs are so great and they're so cool and they're so much fun to hang out with is because they're able to see much farther out and they see order where other people see chaos. Most other people, and that means almost every customer, they only see you know, six months or 12 months ahead. They don't see kind of the bigger vision. And so lots of times people make the mistake of kind of listening to customers. That doesn't mean you shouldn't solicit the, the input of customers. You should. But you should also recognize the customer zone always right. Second is uh, hiring experience over talent. Um, I, I see people that, that will say, well, we should hire this person because you know, that person's done that job before. And I would much rather hire an up and coming A than a proven B, right? And, and lots of times people will go for proven Bs because they have had, they've had the checkbox, you know, uh, uh, on their resume. And obviously you'd rather have a proven A. Everybody would rather have a proven A. But if it were up to me, I always bet on young talent. I always hire unproven A's in favor of proven Bs. Uh, I hear this a lot, you know, uh, VCs will sell the company from under me. That, that's just really, uh, I, I've never had that happen. In almost every occasion where we have ended up selling the company, I find myself constantly in the position of encouraging the team to kind of go for it and, and let's see what we can make, it, make at it. And I would say that they, when they're first time entrepreneurs and they get a meaningful amount of uh, money and the ability to kind of take something off the table, um, they almost all always take it. And they'll always say to me, and the, conversa and the conversation will go something like, hey, listen, you don't get that many swings in the major league. You know, you're at bat. You're in the majors. Let's take a shot and see how big we can make it. And if it doesn't work out, then we can always you know, go back. And they'll, and they'll say, well, I understand, but you have a portfolio of companies, and you've done it before. This is my only bet. This is my first bet. And this is life, you know, landscape changing and life changing for me. And I think I owe it to myself, my family, and all the employees to do that. And I usually say, listen, I support you 100%. I'm just telling you what my position is. 
because at the end of the day, if, if you, Mr. Uh, Mr. or Ms. Entrepreneur, want to sell the company, I'm not going to stand in your way. I'm going to force them to work when they, when they don't want to do it. I mean, that, that doesn't really make any sense. But that, that's a, a common fallacy. Uh, the fourth is I hear this a lot from Y Combinator classes. You know, VCs want to kick out the founders the first chance they get. That doesn't really make sense either. I mean, when I'm investing in a company where there are three people, why would I want to give them the money to build a company and then proceed to want to kick them out? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make any logical sense. You know, my objective is for them to succeed. And if they succeed, then I really succeed. Now, if they're not going to succeed or they need help in order to succeed, then by all means, I'm going to go to them. I'm going to try to convince them that we should hire you know, uh, more people onto the team to help them succeed. But it's, I, I hear this a little bit more than I'm comfortable with that, oh, uh, I, I hear VCs want to just kick out the founders and I want to put in all these protective provisions to prevent the founders from getting kicked out. I, I, I have no interest in seeing any of them leave unless they're not you know, helping the cause and, and causing the company to succeed. And then lastly, good CEOs do what the board wants. I think I mentioned this earlier. Good CEOs do what they think, what, what, uh, they lead the company, and they make their own independent decisions. And I think when a board makes decisions, it's time for a new CEO. So uh, that, that's just not the case. So the final section, and I'm going to try to wrap this up really quickly, is, is talk about what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for are landscape changing ideas. I'm looking for ginormous markets. I'm looking for people who want to change the world, and I don't need a full team when we invest. I just need everybody who's on the team to be really good. I just need a nucleus of excellence. And, and I'm looking for things that can be great businesses. And so I get asked a lot, well, how, wh you know, what do you do for due diligence? You know, there are four things. One, I look at the value proposition. So how compelling is the product or service? And I'll do that by, by doing some customer checks or by you know, anecdotal consumer checks. I'll look at markets. Uh, I'll, I'll look at rough market size estimations. I'll do a lot of back of the envelope. Uh, I'll, I'll try to see what are analogous type services or what are analogous type products and how do I figure out kind of how many customers there are, what their market adoption rate is going to be, and how much they'll pay. And I look for analogies all over the place that lead me to give me some level of comfort as to how big the market size is. And it doesn't need to be exact. I think markets come in three sizes, small, little, and large. I'm sorry, small, medium, and large. And, uh, and, and I'm looking for large markets. But I need to know about how big the market is. And if it's big enough, that, that's really what I'm looking for. And I always look at analogies. Uh, in terms of evaluating people, I always look, I, lo I, I think I mentioned this, I look at what, what motivates him or her. If the person is very young and they haven't had a lot of experience, I look for some patterns of excellence. And if there's a lot of patterns of me mediocrity, well, I tend to stay away from that. I, I always ask, you know, what do you think are your strengths and weaknesses? Because I, I want somebody who's really self-aware. And I'll, of course, I'll, I'll call all, a bunch of other people that are on or off their reference list to hear what other people say. And finally, I want to predict the business model. You know, I don't, you know, not all businesses today have a business model, but I want to at least have a thesis on what would could be. And, you know, what are the customer economics and who else has done something like this? And I think I talked about that before. I'm going to skip that and, and go to just talk about the quick rules um, and, and say, you know, my rules are you should pick really big markets. And like I said, it's either markets or people. I'm, I'm on the, I'm about 51, 49 markets type person. Um, market leaders get the majority of rewards. You know, never compromise on people. You know, my observation is that A's hire B's, B's hire C's, and once you get C's in the company like cockroaches, you just not, cannot get them out. You should definitely do analysis. Do the analysis. At the end of the day, you got to go with your gut. You can't do you can't do analysis paralysis, and I see this all the time. What you want to do is enough work to to know what kind of decision you're making, and then. You're going to make, you're going to make a, a gut decision at the end of the day. And lastly, be flexible. There's more than one path to success. So I'm going to finish with five pieces of advice for, for those prospective entrepreneurs in the audience. One is to think huge. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to go after little markets. Uh, your, your time is too valuable. Uh, the second is once you decide to go, uh, you should move, go, and move very quickly. Uh, get more help than you, you think you need. Uh, you can, you can you know, I know I said, you know, hire after growth, but, but get, getting help in over horsepowering is uh, typically you want a lot of expertise, you know, in a startup company because it's hard. Uh, don't focus on dilution, focus on outcome. I think I talked about that. And lastly, learn from others who've come before you. 
So with that, I'm, I apologize for having gone through this all so rapid fire. I'm happy to take any questions in the remaining seven minutes. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jeff. Great talk. Um, very insightful. What's your preferred source of deal flow? We've got a project. Think it fits. How should we best approach it? Um, you know, I mean, the, the best way, uh, the, the best entree into any venture capitalist is, is through, uh, through a referral, you know, ideally. And if there isn't, then you just, you know, just feel free to email any, anybody in the firm and everything will get looked at, right? You know, obviously, the way, uh, I mean, the Valley is a pretty small place, and, you know, all of us take a uh, source of referral as a very um, uh, more seriously, you know, the better the source of referral, the more, the more seriously something somebody will take, take it, but uh, we look at everything. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. It's inspirational talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, boiling the ocean. Yes. I was wondering, in terms of market segment, what do you think is going to be the largest ocean going forward from your point of view? Okay, so the question is, what's the largest, uh, boiling the ocean, what's the largest segment of the ocean that, that's attractive? And, and um, uh, I, I kind of, uh, th there was a slide in here, I was going to talk a little bit about what our core investment themes are. Uh, but, you know, generally, generically speaking, you know, platforms is a really interesting place to be. Uh, uh, both uh, new platforms, you know, every time, Everyone says there's no more platforms, right? And just like I remember when um, uh, Google was dominating search, everybody said there's nothing going to be, you know, that's going to be it. Every, every internet search is going to be dominated by uh, a search bar. And, and then all of a sudden face, uh, MySpace comes along, and then Facebook comes along, and then Twitter comes along, and, and, you know, and so forth. And people say uh, nothing will ever dominate the uh, operating system world because Windows has everything and then all of a sudden Android and iOS come along. So I still think that there is opportunity for new platforms as, as you know, uh, mobile, you know, the, the world goes mobile and, 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 and mobile devices really become the, the compute platform and having so much power in people's hands is, is really remarkable. Then you also have applications on top of existing platforms. Uh, you know, you can plug into over three billion users by by connecting to uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, iOS, Android, you know, LinkedIn, uh, Xbox. Uh, I think next generation entertainment is a space that I'm spending a lot of time on. Uh, people are viewing entertainment in all sorts of different places uh, on all sorts of different pieces of glass and they have, uh, right now, finding content is really difficult. Um, you have to enter credentials in all over the place. It's really hard to uh, you, you know, uh, content is more tied to a device rather than to a person. Uh, and you have all this new content coming up. I mean, I talked about machinima. We're investing in that theme on next generation content networks. You know, data is, is huge. I mean, people are spewing so much information out there and everybody wants to be able to get real time analysis to be able to crunch the data and be able to have, to be able to look at it on their mobile phone or on their tablet. And then lastly, enterprise cloud and mobile, uh, you know, everything that's happening in the consumer internet is moving to the enterprise, and I think that's going to happen over the next 10 years. So those are our four themes. Yeah. Um, do you have any uh, advice or examples on, on when to pivot, how to pivot, and how to just let go and have you know, your baby? So the question is, uh, do we have any advice on uh, how to, uh, when to pivot, how to pivot, and when you let go of your baby? And pivot is you know, one of the most popular words out there today. Uh, and it basically means uh, something isn't working, uh, but you have you know, some resources or you have a team and you want to apply that to uh, a, new, a, new, uh, a new area. You know, it, it's kind of hard to say because you, you rarely ever get things right on the first shot. But what you're looking for is some validation that what you're doing it, you know, has some traction and then you're not pushing a rock up a hill. And so it's a really hard question to answer, you know, kind of in the generic, but you kind of know when you feel it. Uh, you know, if, if something starts working, you get a pretty good sense that it's working. But if it's been out there for a while and you're not getting, let's say it's a consumer thing, you're not getting any real, any real engagement and things are just trailing off and you've tried a whole bunch of different hooks uh, to try to get people to, to, to use the, um, to use whatever you're trying to do, then that, that's probably a pretty good sign. I'd say you kind of know it, 
uh, when you see it, and uh, uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't give up, but you, sh you shouldn't bang your head against the wall forever either. Yeah. Uh, I just want to know that what kind of skill set do you think is more important for an entrepreneur? Because you said that uh, the idea is important. It's very is the, the main part. And uh, how can we come up? What kind of skills are we for, to look for in order to come up with ideas and uh, uh, my, my next question is a little bit specific. I'm, I have an engineering background, and you said that the proof is important in order to attract the investors. So we have to show them something to, uh, uh, so that they, they, they trust us. So technical skills can be helpful, but what other skills? Is OK, so the question is, uh, um, what kind of background is the best for starting a company, and, and what kind of skill sets? So, so you know, my observation is that the best, uh, almost all great entrepreneurs, uh, I think, have a real product mentality. You know, and by product, I mean product or service. Okay, and and the best, you know, the best I find are are you know, people who have a technical background, but really understand, uh, kind of, uh, can put their heads and be the voice of the customer, whether a consumer or it's a it's a uh, uh, an enterprise. And so, I always look for people who are great product people. You know, ideally. You know, so you look for engineers, uh, and you look for engineers that aren't just technically skilled, but also, like I know a bunch of great engineers, but they have no product sense, right? And that's not great. Uh, if, if you are like that, then marry yourself with someone who's really good product sense. I know a bunch of product people who aren't technical, uh, but they have a really good sense of what could be done if I could just do it this way. They just don't know how to do it. If you're that kind of person, I'd marry yourself with, with a technical person. Um, but those are the best people to start companies. They tend not to be the finance people. They tend not to be the um, manufacturing or operations people. Uh, they tend not to be human resources. It tends to be some form of, of technical or marketing, but the common theme is product, really heavy product orientation. And you want, to, you want somebody who's really the voice of the customer or the consumer. Please join me in thanking Debbie. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly.